Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Ramfos. I'm the director of the National Operations Center of Excellence at ASHTO. And uh, just uh, wanted to also let you know, we have a uh, exhibit booth um, in the exhibit area. So if you're uh, interested in what we're doing, feel free to stop by. We'd love to talk with you about uh, how we'd like to work with the TDM community. Um, so just quick show of hands, how many folks know what TISMO is? Oh, good, good portion of folks, that's great. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about what it is. But yeah, what we're trying to do today is um, we're looking to, um, our, our distinguished panel here um, is gonna be talking about the intersection uh, between TDM and TISMO and um, some of the uh, interesting things that are going on, not only here in Colorado, but all across the country. And uh, so one of our goals at NOCO is uh, to really bring in uh, the various transportation disciplines um, in, into what we're doing. Um, we have a, a, trans, a first edition transportation operations manual that has a lot of information in there. It's almost like the encyclop what I would call it the encyclopedia of TISMO. And uh, there is there are sections in there on multimodal and TDM. So it's something that you may want to take a, a, a close look at. But um, you know, our main focuses are on things like uh, workforce development, um, working with students, uh, getting them into, into the pipeline for transportation. Uh, we also do a lot with arterial management, managed lanes, um, and then a lot of TDM supporting strategies that are out there. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware of uh, some of our offerings, we do a lot of uh, free webinars, uh, peer exchanges, uh, and uh, you know some of those are virtual, some of those are in person. So we're really looking to get more of you involved in, in what we're doing, particularly if you have a story to tell or if you have a best uh, case practices or best practices that we could do case studies because we do also offer case studies. Um, that would be something we'd be very interested in um, speaking with you about. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator. Uh, Bob Pfeiffer. Bob is with the Colorado Department of Transportation. He has over 30 years of leadership within the telecom uh, inf inf information technology and transportation industries. Um, and his focus is really on the convergence of transportation and technology. Um, he currently serves as the Deputy Director of Operations with CDOT, and that includes incident and emergency management, traffic operations, um, avalanche mitigation, like to hear more about that. Um, and artillery and explosives, uh, meteorology and technology. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Bob to the podium. Oh. Yeah, sit there. So uh, I don't think I need to, do you wanna know about Avalanche? We have a few of those here in the state, but uh, um, believe it or not, it does impact traffic. <laughs> So we have 250 avalanche paths we have to manage. So I have DOT maintenance folks that actually go up and shoot artillery to knock it down on the highway. And even our traffic engineers don't know that we do that. But uh, I don't think it's TISMO, though. It has an O part. But uh, anyway, so today we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk to the panelists. And we're just going to have an open conversation around a few things. Uh, let's start off with uh, TDM changes with the TISMO framework. And let's just kick it off there. So we often talk about integrated corridor management and TDM being the backbone on which uh, quite a few TISMO policies and programs are built. So asking the panelists, and either somebody can jump in, whoever would like to, or I'll kick us off. How has TDM transformed in the last decade as the TISMO framework gained traction across the country in terms of making more efficient use of the existing transportation infrastructure? Carrie or Pam, do you want to kick us off? Or? Yeah, thank you. Um, so at WASHDOT, TDM and TISMO are within the same umbrella. Um, you'll see in a minute the slide, but we think of operating and managing our system is what we do. We're capacity constrained in Washington State. That means that we don't have space to build more facility or expand our roadway. And so we really need to focus on the operational and management of our system. And TDM is a, a huge component of that. Um, in one slide over, um, you'll see just how we define um, TISMO or transportation system management operations. It's really a it's it's a toolbox that allows us to um, 
to consider how we plan and the policies that we do to um, effectively manage our system. It's about transportation operations, so signal operations, what we can do to make sure that things are moving efficiently. It's about um, technology. It's about um, ITS, um, um, for those that know, Intelligent Transportation Systems, and it's about TDM. So TDM is a big component of what we talk about when we talk about managing the multimodal system at WashDOT. And I think in, in terms of TISMO, the way that the, the TISMO umbrella has expanded over the years, you know, started with freeway operations, and now there's a real focus on optimizing multimodal operations. And, and TDM and TISMO, they have a lot of strategies that I'd like to call supportive strategies, if you will. Um, so there are just maybe more traditional TISMO strategies like transit signal priority that would make transit a more attractive option to people by you know, reducing headways, becoming more reliable. Uh, there's also traffic calming measures which support bicycle and pedestrian uh, safety. And, and I think um, there's also, on, on the TDM side, I think one thing, and we're gonna touch on this more as we go through this discussion, not all of the TDM strategies are implemented by a single agency. So it's not just the DOT, just the transit agency, MPO, local government, uh, or employers, you know, when you're talking about incentives. So I think it's a big, um, it's sort of a, a, a big space to be in and collaboration is required. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Alan Greenberg, uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration. Our office kind of leads a lot of TISMO work, um, and um, I'm probably one of the less knowledgeable people within our office on TISMO, although since they know so much, that means I know at least a modest amount about it. But I think the reason I, I was included in this panel and maybe not someone who uh, is more immersed in TISMO is that my approach to the TISMO community is something probably similar to what a lot of TDM folks uh, locally and at the state level are dealing with when they're approaching the TISMO community. So I've, I've learned a fair amount um, in trying to interact with folks that are doing this and um, putting the TDM and TISMO measures together where appropriate, figuring out what overlaps and what doesn't. And I know we're going to get into the details of that in just a little bit. So thank you. Yeah, I'll just uh, give like a real life experience here around when you talk about TDM or corridor management here in Colorado, we we have these things called mountains that get in the way sometimes and we just can't unfortunately widen an interstate through the mountains as easily as, as uh, maybe some other states. But we actually implemented with limited infrastructure uh, a peak period shoulder lane uh, on a very narrow shoulder, but it's only open when it gets really congested. Uh, we implemented within the corridor as well uh, a variable speed limit uh, that also helps slow the traffic down a little bit. Also, when you when you open up the peak period lane, we um, naturally create a safer environment because people will slow down. It's a little bit snug, it's a little tighter, and, and the VSLs have been really helpful to kind of communicate if there's a crash around the corner or anything, and we tapered down the the speeds so that people are coming up to a back of a queue, we kind of slow them down. So when you talk about like throughput and TDM and corridor management and ITS and it all coming together, when you talk about the principles and program coming together, uh, our, we call it PPSL, our PPSL area uh, up in the corridor has been very successful. In fact, uh, we were just reviewing the last few years of it because we're trying to get FHWA to give us more hours. We're only allowed to operate it so many hours a year. But uh, we, we've seen an actual increase of safety, a reduction in crashes uh, when the PPSL is activated. So we get further throughput and a safer corridor. And I think that's where all those principles and the program comes together. So real life experience here in, in uh, Colorado. So uh, that kind of leads me actually into the second question around you know, TDM and, and the specific uh, TISMO strategies. Uh, so TISMO is often described as a suite of strategies and technologies to efficiently uh, re reduce crashes and increase mobility, and TDM often plays a big role in these uh, strategies. Um, 
And so I don't know who we're going to kick it off with first, but I'll ask the question so he wants to dive in. Um, how does TDM fit into these strategies, uh, like freeway, uh, freeway and major arterial management, performance-based measures, travel information, safety, transportation solutions, and digital infrastructure, data, et cetera? So anyone want to talk about your how does TDM fit into these strategies? We talked a little bit about that. I think, you know, the demand management is one category of of TISMO strategies, if you will. And so, you know, when you're talking about um, parking management or congestion pricing, um, trying to make it easier for you know rideshare, uh, dynamic matching. Um, dynamic wayfinding, there, there are a lot of ways uh, to make it where people will say, oh, either it's much easier to share a ride or it's much harder to take my single occupant vehicle. Um, I think that looking at those types of options um, can help drive behavior. And I think it really does come down to making the other options more appealing making it where it is a viable option. And, and there's, there's a whole bunch more to that. You know, you want transit to be um, a great option for people. Well, then it needs to go where the people need to go. It can't take four times as long as your single occupant vehicle or nobody's gonna do it, you know, because everybody has schedules to keep. Um, but, and I think another way is like with event management and looking at, uh, fare-free strategies or reduction in fare to drive people to use transit for special events and things like that. Carrie, hey, can I ask you a question about that? That was a good point. Talk about transportation needs to go where people want to go. I'll give you an example here in Denver, Colorado. We, we actually have an issue with our last mile provider when you talk about mass transit. Um, what are some ideas that you may have that little steps to encourage increased ridership or in, you know, remove the barrier of entry so people feel more comfortable. Because out west, I think a lot of people just are more comfortable in getting in their car and just going. Um, so maybe what are some small little things that some folks can do that can start like enabling that 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 feelings? Some folks just don't feel comfortable doing maybe ride share or jumping on right. the bus. Right. Well, I think I mean there's certainly a lot of studies around. Um, equity and users, you know, um, you find in like the shared mobility, um, males use the e-scooters more than females. There, there, there's a lot of, I think, safety perceptions around it. I think there, a lot of this stuff really boils down to communication and messaging. Um, and in the same way that agencies take the time to message about, you know, priced managed lanes, for example. Um, why we're doing this and how to use the lanes. And, and it's just this like constant and consistent messaging, which is important because you always have new drivers uh, moving to the area and you have drivers uh, aging in, for lack of a better term, you know, they're, they become eligible to drive. And I think the same can be said for a lot of these, you know, um, shared, shared mobility, um, understanding where to use the scooter, how to use the scooter, making it easier, um, when, you know, making it easier to plan your trip on the transit, showing the people that we have all of these options for you to choose from. I think a lot of times if the user has to do all of the research themselves, it's much easier just to get into your car and drive alone. Yeah, I was just going to expand on that. In Washington State, we passed legislation. So if you're under 18, you get a transit pass. And I think that's where it really starts, is if we can get this next generation to feel more comfortable just using transit um, for all, you know, just how they how they move around um, their cities and the, their um, regions is, is where it really starts from. And so I, I've heard, I, I mean, I have someone here that's um, working pretty heavily on that. And my understanding has been very successful. And other things that we've been doing 
doing, like you mentioned, su shuttle service. So we have van pools and we're trying to reimagine. They were really designed for commuters and we're trying to reimagine how we can um, change the paradigm to one where essential workers can use it. So reducing some of the restrictions around the, the van pool, I believe we passed legislation to actually allow that to happen. And now we've we, there's other other issues that have um, arisen. So it hasn't quite been able to get the momentum. But as we, uh, the issue mostly has been just getting van pool providers to give us vans. But once we do that, I think there's this huge opportunity to um, to allow people to incentivize people to change their travel behaviors. I think I should move to Washington State and convince you all I'm under 18. Um, <laughs> The um, so one of the questions is what what is what do people think Tismo really is, and part of it is a focus on things being very real time. Although I've when I've put that forward, I'm told that that's not exclusively the case. But our agency, when we were incorporating demand management into Tismo, they specifically did it through something called ATDM, which is active. Um, so they were looking specifically at the subset. We're, we're looking more expansively at the moment. But at the time, there was looking for the subset of TDM strategies that could be applied kind of on the spot. That's a limited subset. And um, it's also a little bit more of a limited way of looking at TISMO because People do back up. They do recognize that there's special events coming up in a week or a day, or that there are times of the day and week that are particularly problematic. So it's not like they're always doing everything on the fly. But there is kind of a little bit of a bias to what can you do on the fly. And you can do some things with TDM on the fly. Um, you can. There are cases, for instance, in the Bay Area where they would announce on uh, a how many parking spots at a BART station are available so you're approaching a, a freeway exit. Um, and there's other things that can be done on, on the fly too, certainly the routing stuff. Um, you can do some things in the morning before people choose to take their car and use it for commuting purposes. But the truth is, and this is maybe the, a bit of a tension between the two, is the truth is, your more impactful, significant TDM strategies, really, you're going to get them by backing up. You're going to get them by not having the employer pay for employee parking. You're going to have uh, work those by having someone comfortable before they go to work with an alternative <laughs> to driving alone to work. Um, the fly works too. You can sort of delay your departure sometimes if there's a big traffic incident. So part of it is defining, well, what it, where, where are the overlap measures, and can we do a better job w with those measures? And I think we're going to get into some of the specifics in a little bit, so I can hold off on that for the moment. Is it on? Uh, I was just going to expand. Um, you know, there is that traditional TDM, which is the commute trip. Um, and as I mentioned, a, a lot of our patterns are changing, and we'll get a little into that in a, um, in a little bit. But um, what what Tismo does is it's it's looking at the multimodal user. And so our role now is we've we've really created a system where vehicles have the opportunity to use their their cars to travel. And so uh, in Washington state and I think across the country from my understanding even with the feds the priority is how can we fill in the gaps to help um, create a safe space for all our users. Um, this is kind of off topic but at, in Washington and I think across the country too crashes are on the rise. We're seeing a huge uptick in, um, in crashes, and the people most impacted are the vulnerable road users. So in Washington State, our priority is, how do we create a safe space for these people, not the walkers, bikers, and um, transit users? In fact, what we're really seeing is a lot of these crashes are happening around transit stops. So um, what can we do to make a safe space for the um, first last mile connections? And TDM is a big part of that. How do we fill in the, how do we, um, because TDM is changing behavior and TISMO is how can we fill in those gaps? So there's this, I, I feel like there's this huge um, dependency on each other to do that. Yeah, and you remind me of a, 
a show I saw the other day around some town in New Jersey, just changing the paint markings around their transit stop, that actually reduced the crashes. And it's just creating a different environment for people to feel comfortable and kind of community, you know, telling the uh, vehicle or the driver to do certain things just by the, the painting on the, on the road. So, um, you know, for me on this question, I think the biggest thing that when I, when I left uh, the tech world and I was telling some folks, uh, my wife negotiated my pay cut to be a state employee. Um, one of the things that I, I think I got frustrated with, the, with sometimes the state, we don't, we don't always understand, like we have a lot of information, we have a lot of data. We've, we gather you know, uh, speeds, what type of vehicles are in which lanes, uh, usage. Um, how do we transform that data and put it in the hands of each individual even in this room or coming to visit. Uh, so back in September of 2021, uh, I decided uh, to basically open up all our data. And not only did I create um, APIs and connections to all of our database for anyone to, to download the data, we turned around and created several or an app and, and a website that we were already having a high usage. In fact, um, we're gonna probably exceed 200 million hits this year and during a snowstorm, uh, I have 6,000 to 8,000 active users every second on my app or, or website. And I can hit over 8 million uh, hits within 24 hours during a snowstorm. Just so you know, the state of Colorado is only 8 million people. So to give you an idea, we are getting an increase of people trying to be informed on their traveling experience or decision making just based on the data put in their hands. I put cameras, I put message boards, I put travel time, I put routing. You can route just like Google. In fact, Google's met with me on how they can route better. Um, we put mile posts so that if somebody gets hurt or injured, they know where they're at. It's really trying to make sure that all that decision is, is made there. And in fact, now it's bloomed into creating a, uh, another app called Code Transit, where we're gonna bring all the bus services and trans, uh, transit services onto one app. When you talk about one, barrier of entry, I'll tell you, fr frustrating for me, I, and I have, let me digress, I'm also an elected official, I'm a city council member, so if any of you work for a city, you can understand. Now my town, it's not a town, it's, it is the fifth largest city in the state, uh, it is a city, I only have two bus lines in a 40 square mile city, and it only services really two <coughs> artillery roads. There is an affluent part of the city that's willing to, to spend, but but the transit's not there to ride it. Um, some of the frustrating uh, things that we've experienced is we can't get the single occupant cars off the road. You know, we're trying last mile, we're trying all sorts of different things. I uh, forgot where I was gonna go with that now, now that I was rambling on. See, I shouldn't digress. Sorry, I had a late flight from San Jose last night, so if anyone came from California, uh, I didn't get in until about midnight. Um, but trying to make sure that you know, one of the, the nervous parts for any user that I've, I've experienced is, is the idea of, okay, well, I'm, I'm here in the town, I'm gonna get on a subway, I'm gonna get onto this bus, and then trying to buy all the different tickets. So our Code Transit, we'll just buy it once, doesn't matter who, if it's private or public, it will be one ticket and you get throughout the entire state. Uh, you can go to ski resorts, you can go to a town, you can go to the cities, you can go almost to Utah. Um, we are hoping to have that launched by this fall. Um, we already, focusing on one of our corridors first to just see what it looks like, the pilot. The thing is, is here in our state, everyone has local control. And in our state law, local control, that means that all the individual governments all have their own thoughts and opinions and they don't wanna gather into one state um, app. So overcoming some of the political challenges it could also be challenging to encourage uh, uh, you know, some of those, those burdens of, of accessing transit. So. Uh, again, you know, like I said, data sharing I think is critical in this this topic. Uh, I think that the more you share, I think the wiser folks are making decisions. So that leads me into our next question. If there's not anything else on that topic, um, so basically the questions around how does uh, TDM support the TISMO um, ca uh, capability maturity model or strategic planning process? So in TISMO program, growth at state and local levels has largely been through both uh, capability maturity model evaluations and the TISMO strategy plans. So what has TDM programs and service, services 
uh, role been in this process? Uh, I can keep going through the questions, but I probably should stop there because there's like five of them. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so in Washington State, like I mentioned, TISMO and T TDM sits within the TISMO um, umbrella. And so we, we're similar to Colorado where our regions, um, we have six regions in Washington <laughs> State and they have local, they have their own authority and how they handle what data, you know, how they collect data and how they operate their systems. There's some, some obvious um, uh, legislation that they have to follow. But um, <clears throat> so we did do the capability maturity model in five of our six regions and did ask a TDM component to see how our regions were applying t TDM within the TISMO mindset. And it was interesting. Everyone understood TISMO, or sorry, everyone understood TDM, thought it was a really valuable tool, but they didn't know how to use it and they didn't have the funding for it. And we'll get into the funding conversation later. But um, I think there's a huge appetite. And like I mentioned earlier, we're capacity constrained. We have mountains and lakes and oceans and uh, or an ocean. <laughs> and so um, we just can't expand anymore. And TDM really has to be what we do. Um, we have to have that be a part of what we do. We have to get people off our streets and give them different safe options to use. And so um, I think there's this huge appetite for it, but between funding and really understanding what the intent of TDM is. So it's a lot of education, not only to our uh, customers, but also within our, with ourselves too, to just understand how we can partner with our TDM or how our traffic engineers can partner with our TDM folks so we can have a um, clear vision of what our goals are. Uh, so in the TISMO space, we um, have focused a lot on putting a lot of traffic analysis types of tools out. And so the first thing generally with TDM is if you want to have a conversation with a community focused on whatever it might be, you want to be able to have that conversation on the terms that they're operating. So if it's a TISMO community, we're... Um, <coughs> First of all, understanding what those models are, but then we're contributing to them. So we've, for instance, we have a, um, a parking cruising uh, cruise detector tool. That's quite cool, actually. Happy to have users, and if people have um, challenges with the use, we're happy to sort of work with folks to overcome those challenges. But you know, maybe a, a traditional analysis approach is just sort of accepting the traffic you see and going from there. And I think a, a TDM orientation of that was, well, we don't necessarily accept that. We, we um, some portion of the motorists in a particular congested area are actually circling because they haven't figured their parking situation out. We can, we can, we know, we, we can figure out what that portion is. We have a way of uh, tracking whether a vehicle is going a logical path to a destination or going a path that would only be reasonably explained by search for a place to put the vehicle. Um, and there are remedies. We have uh, variable priced meters. Um, San Francisco led the way, but other jurisdictions are now doing some version of it uh, where it is demand. Uh, it, it doesn't change at the moment, but it's 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 pricing based on supply and demand so that you never have the theory and, and to some degree the practice is you never have a particular incentive to cruise and there's parking available everywhere, but it's a lot more expensive in the most popular areas and it's a little less expensive if you go a few blocks away. So we have those tools. Uh, there's some cost in implementing that and so knowing where the problems are the biggest can help, you di help direct you to um, uh, where to apply them. There's also a huge, one area where there's, there is quite a lot of overlap is in the curb management space. Um, curb management is access to transit stops. It's access to micromobility. It's certainly pedestrian safety and it's um, <laughs> bike lanes. And also we have street amenities people. Um, that's an important thing to make streets function positively and, and more safely as well. So th there's actually a fair amount um, uh, sort of understanding each other in the TISMO TDM space. And um, uh, I think that's kind of a first step if you're trying to bring TDM to the 
TISMO folks within your jurisdiction? Uh, yeah. You're good? So, you know, Pam, you brought up the uh, funding. So what prioritization does TDM have in, in your planning, you know, funding process? Or whoever wants to answer it. You mentioned it. Yeah, um, like I mentioned, I think there's a huge appetite to implement TDM and TISMO strategies in our state, but the funding um, is it, not so clear. We do have funding. So in mega projects, we've been really successful at seeing TDM, particularly around construction. So as we're constructing projects, um, we are looking at, t at different types of strategies to get people out of their cars around construction sites. So one of our major um, projects was some, we had a big dig in Seattle, similar to Boston. Fortunately, we had a better outcome, or sorry for Boston folks. We just learned a lot from you all, so we were able to just do it a little bit quicker, but um, it did take quite, I don't know the exact time, maybe eight years, was it, Michael? Five years, okay. So we it took about five years, and during that time, we ha um, invested heavily in expanding our transit service, in um, creating a d different different opportunities for people to travel. I don't remember the dollar amount, but it was pretty significant. I want to say about forty million dollars. No, oh, you know, oh, okay. Um, we we invested pretty heavily in the in the. Um, tens of millions of dollars. And I don't know the exact number, but I know it was, the intent was um, to, to get people out of their cars coming into the downtown because the, it was just, there was so much construction going on. And my understanding was, is that the TDM strategies that we implemented are still being deployed today, even after we have the tunnel built. So it was so successful that we continued to have expanded transit service through the downtown. Um, but then for the smaller projects is where we're hitting, you know, um, um, where we're kind of running into a, a into a wall, where we have these ideas and these visions of putting in TDM, but there's not as much funding. So um, that, that I know our legislators understand TDM now and are starting to consider putting uh, putting more funding into it, but we just haven't been so successful. However, I will say one place where we have is in Michael's group in our public transportation. We have a regional mobility grant, and it's been really successful at getting um, our local partners, um, local agencies, transit agencies, and counties to um, think about different things that they can do to make um, not uh, active transportation and transit a competitive form of um, traveling through their region. So things like um, in putting in transit lanes, um, improving bus shelters, increasing um, incentives for people to get out of their cars, um, tons of things. And it's been super successful that I believe our legislator even our legislators have increased funding for that to I don't know the how much they've increased it to, but I think it's, 38 million this biennium, so quite a bit. Um, and we've seen some really great things that we can do with our local partners. I think this, this discussion of, of funding and project prioritization really makes me want to put a plug in for uh, TISMO program planning and TISMO strategic planning. Um, as everyone in here knows, when it comes to the transportation system, there are finite resources, there's finite space. Um, the agencies that seem to be advancing TISMO uh, in many cases have a either fix it first or TISMO first policy that was born out of their strategic plan. Um, other things that come out of TISMO program planning are a prioritized list of actions. You know, you can't do everything all at once and you can't fund everything all at once. And there, when you're talking about TISMO and, and multimodal, we've talked a lot about bicycle, pedestrian. There's also freight to consider different uh, facilities may have different priorities in terms of users. And I think without a strategic plan or without a program plan, it can all feel very overwhelming. And there's, you know, a hundred things to do and, and I am in charge of one of them, you know. And I think that having that plan as a backbone can help agencies develop project prioritization criteria that can support these TISMO and TDM uh, you know, supportive strategies to bubble up to get funded. Um, so a lot of, one advantage of TDM strategies, a lot of them can be, in a relative sense, not that expensive and uh, also almost not entirely project-like. I mean, there's a big policy component as well. 
Um, one of the things we try to do with federal highways is we kind of listen to what areas are trying to accomplish and give them tools to, to potentially accomplish them. So we're not telling anyone what they have to do or not do, but we are listening and trying to be helpful. So, for example, um, there was a lot written and concerns about uh, ride hail vehicles in some cities in particular adding significantly to congestion. And we did analysis. Uh, we had some really good data sources to do this. We had a, a from a particular uh, uh, ride hill company, we can't name them, but we had data on from 15 cities and 4,300 plus users, and we had both ride hill choice data and we supplemented it with survey data appended to that. And we um, created sort of a model dealing with pricing and time delay. And the bottom line is, then we did step two later on because people weren't necessarily using our model that much. So we said, well, why don't we use what we created? And if you um, delay in most cities by five minutes a matchup between someone choosing a ride hill vehicle alone, uh, when the option of a shared ride hill ride was also made available, which it's unfortunately not always, it's not offered at all on Lyft and it's offered much more sparingly these days on Uber, but we were able to double the share that would choose a, uh, the portion that would choose to share a ride hill trip by just merely creating a delta of five minutes of where, where you had to match up. And there was some, to be con uh, candid, there was some you know, internal discussion whether DOT should be putting this out. Are we suggesting that people can't uh, do this? And uh, you know, I, I pushed back and sort of ultimately won that one where I said, look, we, we, we physically create bus lanes where, where we know that the impact is delaying the people that can't use the bus lane but we're rewarding the people that are, and you're rewarding a lot more people than you're delaying. And so we found that we were able to bring the share up to over 50% in half the cities. And these were really, really good data sources. So there are our policy options. Part, part of what we do is we, we look at data and technology and new opportunities. The variable meter pricing is only because we have that capacity that we didn't have before. I mean, if you look at today's challenges, we saw motorization actually increase to beyond the pandemic level in most places, and yet the number of people going to the physical work site is down. And so what can we do there in a sort of nimble way? Well, one good part of that is it moves the question of whether there used to be the default of a monthly parking provision, and now it may not be worth an employer doing that. Maybe an employer that wants to help out is only supporting their employee on a daily basis. Well, that's a lot easier to cash out. And we also find through studies that we've done that when people have a daily choice, they're more, much more responsive than, than if they have a monthly choice. So that's, a, and we, we do some analysis and have done analysis on that. So that's, that's another example of sort of maybe out of the box thinking that is trying to respond to today's Real world, and then I, I won't. I'll, I'll skip on my opportunity on the next one. But I'm so excited about this question about <laughs> that. I, I just want to throw one more example. I, I think the, 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 another thing people that aren't thinking about is the insurance space. Um, so it's a huge price people pay. It's an access price. Uh, there's a lot of access cost to using a car. The vehicles are really expensive. Insuring it has gone, you know, twenty percent plus year over year for the last couple of years, increases in insurance rates. It's very, very expensive to access a car, and that brings up equity issues where people need it for essential trips, but maybe don't need it for less essential trips. So the idea is you want to make access less expensive, but the variable cost more expensive. And we, a plug for a session we're doing tomorrow morning at 1030, we've done a big state level analysis of repricing strategies. and. There's huge, huge impacts uh, if you want to look at sort of VMT um, results. But I will say specifically on the insurance side, if you think about it, people, when they're 
the risk of a claim is when you're driving and not when you're not driving, except, you know, the random tree falling on your car when it's parked in your own driveway. And you could do an awful lot on the incentive side. People are choosing app-based, usage-based products anyway. You can do an awful lot in terms of engagement and incentives at the micro level. So rather than these sort of, you get hit occasionally with a very large fine for having sped, sped what if you have sort of micro level costs for not driving very well that you're reminded about and engaged with and told, hey, by the way, you can cut those costs right now if you drive more, more carefully. So a lot of times data is used in a negative way. New York Times did a big expose about people not knowing that their data was being shared with insurance companies and so forth. But we can flip that around and give people opportunities and give people incentives and engage them. If we're already knowing, for instance, that they're traveling in quarters. Now, this is, this is if they're willing to do this, where there's a good transit option. Wouldn't it be neat if, if we knew that and said, by the way, that trip you just took, there's a really good transit option that was available to you. So that, that's a whole area I think that, that is kind of exciting and does merge uh, the TISMO TDM world. So that's it for me. Thank you. I think you're leading into the emerging topics, and there's a lot of that popping up. And just give some examples: uh, metering, pricing. You mentioned uh, cash out parking, red hailing, or ride hailing, pooling. You mentioned insurance, um, cloud-based traffic signal prioritization, evaluating benefits and effects, and of those things, and, and as well as you know, advanced traveler information systems that are uh, sharing that information. So. Uh, you know, how will these new technologies impact TDM at the federal, state, and local levels for travelers? Yeah, and, and I'm not going to re repeat my answer, only to, only to say that these are sort of the questions and, and opportunities. I think there's a lot of, when you, when you think of the strategies and examples I just gave, you're now sort of squarely in the TISMO space where you're working with people, you're influencing their trip making, you're looking at sort of prioritization of the broader TISMO goals, but you're engaging with individuals uniquely. Your, your app for your ride hail request is now giving you a choice set or could give you a choice set that's, that's encouraging you rather strongly to choose to uh, share a, a ride, for example. Your insurance could be aligned with the goals that we're desperately trying to meet with speed cameras and other enforcement but we can do it in a way that's actually viewed as a reward and where even when there's quote unquote penalties, they're fairly small scale. They're, they're combined with uh, engagement to uh, encourage changes rather than with, geez, I just got a $300 fine for this one speeding incident. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can go. Um, <clears throat> I, I think um, as stewards of the state, we are, um, it's our responsibility to be um, fiscally responsible with how we use our money. And at, at WASHDA, we are not only capacity constrained, but we're financially constrained at the moment where we just really have to prioritize what we're doing and what, you know, what, what we're doing today that's working and how we can use technology to fill that void. So like Carrie mentioned earlier, it really is important at WASHDA that we had a, a, a a TISMO um, program plan to identify what what we're doing today that we can continue to do and how we can use technology to support and fill that void. And that's what we're at right now trying to do is investigate that. We do a lot of wonderful things with technology. Um, and we also need to make sure and um, step back and say, is this the right approach? Is this what we need to do to be responsible to our customers, meaning the citizens of Washington state? So it's this fine balance. There's some wonderful technology out there and then some that still in, um, needs to be developed to meet what our needs are. And so we're just trying to investigate that right now. Some of the things that I'm really proud of around um, uh, around technology are kind of understanding how our roads are operating. So at the intersection level, near miss technology, putting detection in to see um, if there's um, cra that was, uh, cra things that we can do to avoid crashes. So um, it, it, before a crash happens, how can we bro be proactive, understand how people are, are, are traveling, and if there were potential crashes, what we could do to fix our intersections to make them safer, uh, to make them more um, 
available for all road users. And then LIDAR is another one. What can we do mid-block to improve our system? So for similar reasons, how can we make <clears throat> our um, mid-block crossings um, more effective to meet the needs of the users? Tons of other things too, but also being um, just balancing out with um, what our needs are and what our fiscal responsibilities are. I think one really important thing when it comes to these emerging trends and technologies is, is doing what WashDOT is doing in terms of, of looking at the technology and seeing how they can employ it to achieve their goals. Um, there are a lot of vendors out there that, uh, um, at least uh, from my experience working on some Federal Transit Administration demonstration programs, there are a lot of over-promising and under-delivering, a lot of vendors that are trying to use the transportation agencies' dollars to develop their technology. Um, and so I feel like some of this is buyer beware. Um, in terms of uh, technology that I think is is really coming along, and, and you talked about it as well, is the fair payment integration, making it easier um, for the user. And I think to drive that behavior change, to make people want to take transit, to be able to pay for your first last mile connection and your bus ticket or your train ticket, or in certain areas there may be multiple transit agencies that operate in an area and to make it where people don't have to buy individual tickets. Um, and, and I think one other important thing about the fair payment integration is there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of it is app based which is great, but there is an equity component there for people who do not have smartphones, for people who may be unbanked. And so I'd also like to put a plug in for the, the like keeping the top card, you know, and, and the agency doing more work on the back end to make that work for the user. Huh. I like your comments there, actually. I don't think, I don't know if we were thinking about the whole, you know, tap pay and uh, the cash for the equity. Um, Boy, Carrie, you, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of things. Um, it's interesting, I one of the roles I had prior to coming to the DOT was vendor management. And when you talk about people coming and knocking on the door to try to sell you your goods, uh, since I run the technology arm for CDOT, I get inundated with all sorts of technology. And and you're right, it, it, it over promises, under delivers, or it kind of delivers and it's really expensive. <laughs> There's this gotcha on the back end Oh, by the way, you want that camera that does AI? Oh, well, that's ten thousand dollars, and oh, that's annual, and that's one camera. And I'm like, well, I have fifteen hundred camera locations, so uh, that's not going to work for me. But you know, so don't you know? One of the things I'll tell you, coming from the techie side of the world, um, you don't hear it enough, and it, and I know it sounds probably uh, counter to being good stewards is fail, fail fast. If you run across technology that's popped up it's okay to fail it. In other words, if it's not working, cut the bait, let it go. Even though you spend a couple bucks on it, it's better than spending millions. Uh, we at CDOT had, a, when we were doing our Connected Autonomous Vehicle program about seven years ago with a very large corporation, uh, we promised over $75 million to them over five years. Uh, we ended up 17 million into it, we cut that bait. It was not worth it. We were way more advanced than they were um, and they were over-promising and under-delivering. They didn't have no relationship with the OEMs that they said they did. And you, guess what? You have, to, you have to make those tough decisions. But I was happy to, to lose $17 million versus $75 million on, on that contract. And, and you really have to have um, the comfort to say it's okay. Don't force it to be successful. Don't force it to be there. If it's not going to fit your needs and, it's, and, and, and balancing the technology the cost benefit and the accessibility to it, I wouldn't do it at all, so. Sure. Just about that. Uh, so we've had a lot of successful things and reports that we've put out and we're working. And then we had one project that wasn't very successful and uh, that report's been delayed, but, but, but it has actually gonna be coming out. And I wanna, I wanna sort of, I, I was working with a, a professor said, you know, it really is kind of important that you advertise the things that you did that didn't really work. Uh, it's helpful to others who are trying to work things through. And, and we did have one. And I think it's actually instructive in this space. Um, I think you need to be careful. I wouldn't exclude it. But 
if you're creating a new app with incentives and it's not something people are using all the time, getting usage rates up very significantly is hard. And even if you're working with a company where the app is popular, but you're trying to do new things with it, that's hard too. I'm not saying they're impossible, but we just because you have the ability to connect doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna, when you try these things out, you're gonna get a lot of users necessarily who want to engage. A couple of lessons specific to that that might be worth thinking about. One, if someone's already engaged in an app, that's a positive. Um, two, if people are already paying for something, that's a positive because they're thinking about it. So when we, I'll give one example, when we were testing dynamic ride sharing out in a few different corridors with an app-based system and we we're recording uh, that carpools are happening, we got, I think, a three or four times greater participation level, like 25%, which is very, very high. We got that only in the corridor with the small toll. It wasn't much. The, the toll differential was 70 cents. The incentives we were offering through that were much higher. But there's something about user engagement when they're already using a system and already paying something that they seem to be more willing to sort of engage. We had a, a very interesting exp uh, project with BART, the Bay Area Transit. Um, and we had version one and version two. And so a failure doesn't mean you don't, a failure sometimes means you, 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 you do continue, but you continue in a very different way. Version one, we were trying to get people to not travel the Transbay tube, which is very heavily congested during the peak times. Um, and we were able to do it. We were able to incentivize people out of it, but it cost us 10 bucks a trip. Uh, version two, we did a few things. One is we only targeted people who we knew were already traveling at the time that that was occurring. So we only were willing to partner because we had that data from the, the TAP card, the BART card. Two, we lowered the incentives a lot. You don't have to have crazy high incentives. And three, we did a little more on the behavioral side, uh, more engagement and, and uh, made it fun and more attractive. We got the cost down to a dollar trip. So get someone out of the trend. Version one, uh, which was the Federal Highway funded portion of it, 10 bucks a trip. Then we worked with Federal Transit. They did version two and we got it down to a dollar. So that's the kind of thing where don't assume you've got it figured out in the first shop. So this stuff can work. Engagement can work, but it's new and it's tricky and um, it sometimes takes a few shots. All right, gonna watch our time because the next two are pretty interesting conversation. One, next one's about hybrid work and TDM. So the rise of telecommunication and hybrid work uh, schedules scattered business hours and workforce going through generational change. We've seen that a lot through the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and you know, uh, just what we're seeing here in Colorado is we've exceeded our traffic congestion pre-COVID yet no one's working downtown now i was just in san jose and there was nobody working downtown but you know at least here it's at least hustling and bustling in downtown denver but um that we're also discovering that obviously rush hour is now like 12 15 18 hours of the day it's not whatever six to nine and then three to six it's now six to eight six a.m to eight nine p.m at night and so you know that has uh has uh done a lot on the TDM as well as the impact to the infrastructure. So, you know, knowing all of that, um, how all these changes in the last few years affect TDM programs and services? And I want to see if anyone has their thoughts. So, so on the rise of tel telecommuting and hybrid work schedule, scattered uh, business hours and workforce going through generational change, how all these changes in the last few years affect TDM programs and services? 
Yeah, I'll say similarly in Washington State, the travel behavior has definitely changed. We used to have a very distinct AM peak and PM peak. But even before COVID, we started seeing a midday peak. I think people were maybe going out to lunch or, you know, running errands and we're seeing it even more pronounced now. So the the um, AM peak is probably not as extreme as it was pre-COVID. Our PM peak is back um, and then our, we're getting this midday peak. And so I think there's some investigation that we are still doing to really understand what be, travel behavior is. Um, I'll also say, um, just a plug-in for Washout, if anyone's looking for a new job, we're an awesome organization to work for. Um, and what we did during COVID is we required 40% of our work staff to work from home because we have maintenance crew and people that are that have to be in the fields. That means about 60% of our um, workforce is working from home, and it's been super successful. People love it. Um, but it really is making has change our paradigm of what it means to work um, and how we integrate in, um, interact with our colleagues. I think there's a lot of um, concern that we weren't getting the, the um, water cooler talks, but there's so many different ways and innovative ways to get the workforce to interact. I think, you know, between teams meetings or having intentional um, meetups in, in my group in transportation operations, we do conferences. And I think it's been really powerful. In some ways, it's even more of a it's drinking water all day because we're just getting to, we're hanging out, we're engaging, we're doing really creative ways of problem solving together. So that's just my plug in for WashDOT. Um, but if you could repeat the question one more time so I could talk more globally. <laughs> So, um, you know, knowing that the hybrid work schedule, telecommuting you mentioned, and the staggering business hours and just generational, generational changes, how do these changes affect uh, the TDM over the last few years? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So back to the TDM world. So commuters, um, I live in King County, one of the, mo the most populated um, county in Washington state. Um, commuters, uh, King County Metro was really designed, and I think a lot of our transit agencies across the state were really designing their um, transit service for commuters. And um, during COVID, there's been a huge shift. And so um, I think we don't have an answer yet. There's a lot of investigation. Sorry, King County folks, maybe you know more than I do if there's any here, but really trying to figure out who we need to serve now and uh, prioritizing both the movement of people rather than moving people to work, as well as the essential workers and prioritizing how we can um, move people that don't have access to an individual vehicle. Um, and so that's, it's, I think there's a, maybe invite me back in five years and I'll have an answer to that. But right now it's a lot of investigation around that. The other piece is van pools. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier. We were, our van pool services were really designed to move commuters. Um, and once again, we're looking at how we can make this um, more of a service for essential workers. So um, uh, with the van pools, I think, um, not making it that, uh, I, I don't know all the nuances, but making it so that people have more flexibility in how they use it. So that, that maybe you can just check it out for, it doesn't have to be full. It doesn't have to just be people from one employment center, but people that work in a, in a, in a population center that can all come together and maybe even check out the van pools during the day. Um, there's a little bit of a hiccup to that because we're having trouble getting vans right now, but I think a lot of our local jurisdictions are really interested in the opportunities that can arise from that as we get more van pools. Yeah, let me dive in real quick because I want to counter a little bit. I'm the operations guy. So a little bit, I, I struggle. I have a lot of emotions around this hybrid and change because when we were working in the office, there was a set pattern. It was easier as a agency to manage the infrastructure. Um, but what I've seen over is, okay, people are working from home, uh, say 40% of the time, 50% of the time, maybe 60% of the time, yet traffic is higher than when we were. That, so it doesn't make sense, you know, think we're probably all shopping or doing something else than, you know, than we should be doing, let's just be honest. And then, uh, and running your kids, to, uh, shoot, my wife worked from home. She would run the kids to school and back and, you know, during the work day. So there's a lot of movement. On top of it, during COVID, we all shop from home. So we just added all those Amazon vans all over the place, right? So that just created an impact. We were seeing more wear and tear during COVID than we, on our infrastructure than we do during normal, normal business times when we didn't have such a telecommute environment. So for me, it, it, and now that we see it even all day long, I'll, 
I know this little divergence off this, but the traffic incident management, the Tim side of this, when you talk, talk about incident and life safety and so forth, it's become more stresses on my system to deal with this new environment than it was prior to it. So, you know, for me, I, I have mixed emotions. I get why the concept of, hey, you telecommute, you work from home, you're not driving, you're not a car, that's one less car, you're better on the environment. But in all reality, that's not what's happening. And so that I struggle with it. And that's why I say I have emotional distresses around that topic, I think, more than anything. So, um, you know, kind of keeping that in mind, I don't know where we're going and what the right answer is. And yeah. we can encourage all we can, but I'm not, I'm not seeing that needle move as much, at least in our state. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. We're seeing similar things in our state. And we're also seeing a huge reduction in transit ridership. Um, King County, where I came from, had probably the had robust transit ridership. We, you know, particularly around commuters. And I think this is our time to reimagine what it means to be transit professionals and who we're serving, because we really were focusing from a transit perspective on moving commuters. And and so just. It, it just like re-envisioning. That's why I said I think in five years we'll have the answers. I think this is kind of the pendulum has shifted and now understanding what we need to do to, uh, you know, to meet those new needs. Yeah, absolutely. And one last thing. I'm oh, sorry, Carrie. Go right back to you. Um, man, you know, and, and through all of that, when we talk about safety, and that's going to be the next question, so keep that in mind. When you talk about safety, we have the highest record of fatalities on our interstate in the last four or five years than we have ever had in our history. Now, granted, the uh, the, you know, per capita is grown in our state as well. But, you know, we're, we're, our governor is asking us for a 15% reduction in the fatalities. Obviously, we like to be at zero like anyone else. But 15% for our state is almost 100 fatality reduction. And, and you know, this day and age, and I won't go too far, but we have just recently, this could be people working from from home or what, but we've had a lot of mental health issues on our highways. Just yesterday, right out here, we had a suicide on the highway. And then we had another one uh, going head on. And so when you talk about like working from home and the emotions and everything else, I, the society, the transit, the transportation system has completely changed than what we're used to. Um, so keep safety in mind of how do we continue creating safe environments for people to commute or uh, transit, however that might be in, in our system. So. Um, Carrie, I don't, I know that was kind of a weird well, spin to my safety issue, but we've been, I, uh, yeah, I'll just put a pin in the safety for the next question. But one thing that strikes me about, I think across the board, um, agencies are seeing, um, expanded peak periods or like all day long and, and whether it's, uh, for people running errands during the day or whether it's for, you know, 18 Amazon vehicles now in your neighborhood instead of four. I think the key to um, encouraging mode shift is that flexibility of, you know, if you're not serving the commuter to the central business district, you're not focused only on having these van pools, for example, that run from a certain, you know, area, um, and they, they leave between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. and, you know, they get there. If, if you're looking at um, daily parking cash out, your daily transit options, making the transit schedule where it's not just focused on the peak commuters, you know, where you go from, you know, pre-COVID uh, transit schedules that might have a bus running every 10 minutes between, you know, 6 a.m. and, and 9.30 a.m. and then it switches to every half hour that's not going to encourage someone to use transit in the middle of the day when they need to make a shift. Uh, probably a bigger challenge when you talk about Amazon, and I've actually talked about this with colleagues, um, especially as a working parent, I often rely on a villainous Amazon to get that purple softball belt in a size extra small that I don't have time to drive all around to find. But, but there's no incentive to not just order, 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 order. And even when you look at deliveries, it's like, well, you can get it for free today between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Or you can get it in two days for free, also free. So, you know, th th I think there's a lot of partners uh, that could come to the table t to support um, uh, behavior shift uh, to help the congestion during the expanded peak periods. 
Um, just first of all, I concur with an awful lot of what you said, and actually don't disagree with any of it. Um, I, I would say on so first of all, X traditional audience is a sort of the commuter audience. I still think it's a very important audience. It's maybe slightly less important because people are traveling to work a little bit less, but it's still significant. Work travel, as you point out correctly, they're not often always traditional hours. Um, I happen to ride transit a fair amount in Washington, D.C. and see there's an awful lot of security guard, food workers, et cetera, et cetera riding at the same time I'm riding for entertainment purposes uh, to, to dinner out or a show or something. Uh, so that's one. Uh, two, um, we are focusing, uh, we've been doing some work on examining casual carpooling, which is unique to Washington DC and San Francisco, a little bit in Houston, which is people carpooling with strangers, taking advantage of HOV facilities to get very fast trips. It feels kind of um, errant, but it's quite a big mode in two places. It's everything your mother told you not to do, except that it works. Um, but when you have carpools in particular have a struggle when people have different days. So the idea that you have this small set group of people. Um, so we're trying to, the, the advantage of potentially single trip carpooling is great, but there's a big social component. And we're trying to figure out how to make that grow and uh, we'll see how successful we may be. And then the other issue, too, is, and it was alluded to with the daily cash out, is, is it does present an opportunity to kind of reconsider um, employee um, commute benefits and how we've offered them. And maybe, um, maybe employers are more receptive now to uh, redesigning them because of the cost of providing a monthly parking that you don't really need to provide. And on the safety thing, since you had mentioned that, that's another reason I love insurance. It's a way to engage drivers within the vehicle. It's one of a number of strategies, but and certainly the design stuff as well is very important. But so thank you. I think we all have that little puck, right, to get that discount. I was just going to add a few more things just in terms of ideas and strategies. Um, so in Washington state, and I believe many states have HOV lanes, high occupancy vehicle lanes. And um, traditionally we had it two plus, but to encourage carpool, we're doing things like making it three plus or even exploring other, you know, even more number of people just to get to, because they are faster. And so just giving people an encouragement to consider when they're thinking about carpool, add more people onto, into the vehicle. Um, and then another thing is side sidewalks. Um, you, a lot of across the state, we're just missing sidewalks. And so people don't feel as comfortable um, walking or biking. And so how can um, we're looking at tools, um, particularly around data, we're collecting data around it across the state to see where we're missing sidewalks and to start to prioritize expanding our sidewalks so that people can walk and bike. I think sidewalks are key because if they're not comfortable to walk, that's the first part of it, right? Uh, detached sidewalks have always been more successful. Eight foot sidewalks would be nice if you have the right way to do it. You know, absolutely is an easy win. I'm going to take 20 seconds. My favorite, I do this bicycling in the Montgomery County, Maryland, in the D.C. area. And I have a picture of a sign, which I, on a route I often take. And it literally says, please don't drive on the sidewalk. <laughs> it's a school zone. I'm like, why, why would that be there? And it's a school area. And I think parents picking up their kids are the sort of craziest drivers there are. But literally, this is right across the, you have to put a sign up to say that. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we had a fight to get to the kids. Um, so let's talk about workforce. I mean, that's kind of the next big topic. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to leave a few minutes for any questions. So, you know, the workforce has been a major focus um, in the transportation sector and TISMO and TDMs, especially when it comes to expanding the employment and education pipelines uh, to many disciplines beyond the traditional pathways, engineering, planning, et cetera, the TDM strategies are used as part of the federal, state, and local TISMO policies and programs. So how uh, have workforce needs changed in, in TDM TISMO organization departments in the recent year? How do you, how do you see WashDOT or your organization in private or federal level? 
Yeah, um, I thought we were going to segue into safety, but I guess oh, this. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I was watching time, and then I thought, well, of course. Shoot, I kind of. But I actually think safety. safety comes into this too, and I didn't think about it to just now, so I had an aha moment. But I think operations and transportation professionals really it has changed. You know, I come from a civil engineering background, but I think you know when I came into the field, um, I started off just working with traffic engineers. Now we're transportation operations folks, and it really has brought in a whole slew of different voices between communications, marketing, um, and so I, and data science. I think there's this huge um, opportunity across the board, but the piece about my aha moment is safety. Um, something that I've been kind of thinking about is what is our role and responsibility? I think many of you've heard that um, our Surgeon General has said that loneliness is a national pandemic, and what is our role and responsibility in the transportation space? And I think understanding the medical piece of it and bringing in medical professionals. Um, my son's really good friend's father is a, um, in the medical space. He's a PE, PA, but he works with a lot of um, people that have been in severe crashes. And um, there is just so much that he, when we have, just have like, when we're talking over a beer or something, I mean, there's so much that we can learn from each other too. So I think the, the um, once again, come invite me in five years, because I think there's this huge opportunity that we're going to start to see the changing workforce. I think one of the biggest needs that I've seen in working with transportation agencies uh, specifically to develop, you know, the TISMA plans is there's a, a real hole in the data science space, data analytics. And it's not only a challenge to attract these people to a DOT, but also to make them feel like they have a career path because the career paths have been very traditional for either engineering and, and then uh, planning. So to have someone where you're not, you're not only uh, beholden to consultants to do this work, you know, as someone, I mean, I am a consultant, but as, as, as someone who works with a lot of different agencies, I think it's important for the agency staff to know what the consultant's doing, to be able to understand what is involved. So maybe you use consultants to um, supplement the type of work that you want to do or to do maybe one specialized piece. But I think uh, data analytics is a really important part of the future workforce for DOTs. Okay. Uh, Carrie, absolutely agree with you that sometimes what we forget as DOTs, uh, as agencies or operators is to not just give it to the consultant and run then, you know, fire and forget kind of situation. It's actually need to learn with you. Um, and, and, and Pam, you hit on something that's really good, and, and, and it could feed into your TISMO strategies, which is the roadside safety audits. You know, when, you, when you're when you looking at what can I do to make a road safer or what kind of strategies can I put in there, you know, really bringing a diverse uh, group of professionals that live in the area or residents together to look at what can we do differently within uh, the roads. Uh, so I'll put a plug in for RSAs. Um, so, what changes do you see coming due to either techno uh, technology um, or travel patterns? More around AI, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles. What do you see coming down the pipe if you're, or should we call you back in five years? <laughs> yeah. I can try it. Um... Yeah, I think um, so. At Washington, at WASHDOT, we used to have a um, cooperative autonomous vehicle and cooperative autonomous technology group, and we've really moved more to technology because what we're understanding, I think Carrie brought this up earlier in a different perspective, is that. Um, uh, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of vendors out there, they're very, they want to stay in their silos. And so as a transportation agency, what is our responsibility? What can we do? And it's what can we do in our infrastructure? That's our role. And so how can we make our um, signals autonomous so that they can speak to all the, the vehicle vendors out there? So um, I think I think things are moving in that direction and, and we're, we're treading lightly to figure out what, what is going to be the best um, tools for us, but I think it's a great future. I think there's some really um, great stuff already out there um, with AI and machine learning and helping us do things better. We have toll roads and and um, HOV on ramps, and we're already using a lot of that to be predictive modeling to understand when the demand is going to be there and and when to change our um, our uh, HOV lanes. Sorry, when to change our on and off ramps um, accordingly. So. 
I think in, in terms of some of the uh, emerging trends, the Federal Transit Administration has a number of uh, pilots, uh, dem or funding a number of demonstration projects that are focused on predictive technology to um, be able to look at congestion levels and weather patterns to predict when there might be a higher likelihood for crashes. I mean, it's not really, it's not AI like Minority Report, but it's just some informed decision making. Um, there, in terms of automated uh, vehicles, um, you, you're seeing some of those deployments as uh, first last mile shuttles. Um, and in bus rapid transit, they're all really bleeding edge and they're not quite to level four automation, which level four is driver as passenger. So they're, they're pretty far away from taking the safety operators um, out. But I, I think I'm excited for the next five years to see what, what comes online and, and who gets there first. And I think there's a real role in the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration in, you know, uh, open platforms because there's all these vendors that have a lot of uh, proprietary information and, and that, uh, to your point, Bob, when talking about like, oh, this works, but oh, it's more expensive now. I think that can really be a problem for transportation agencies as they're trying to advance their programs. Sometimes I think we I, I absolutely would should do modeling of future scenarios where there's automated vehicles and so on. I, I'm not dismissing that, but sometimes I think we, we sort of look to the future and not at the present too much. So for example, um, we still have most cars are parked in for most of the day <laughs> and car access is enormously expensive, has gotten much more expensive. And there's a few things we haven't really figured out very well. And I, I'm not sure we're trying hard enough federally and at the state and local level. I mentioned the carpooling, we're, we're trying harder, but we shouldn't be the only ones. We'll probably come out with the pooled funding request and wanna see what states might be interested in, in supporting additional work. I, we don't have it all figured out. We, we're, we're putting our piece forward and maybe there are some other pieces. But the other one is, you know, we've done some work on peer-to-peer -peer car sharing I don't think we've cracked that. It's, it's sort of interesting. Even people who are willing to put their car up to somebody else, they're kind of fussy. So one statistic I remember, there was like a 10 times as many people, well, based on the statistics where we asked owners whether their car was like dinged or damaged versus asking users whether they dinged or damaged a car they used. And there was like a 10 times differential between owners who said, yeah, the car is damaged and users said, no, no, that didn't happen with me. Um, but, but there was a group of people that seemed to be okay, and that was car owners who said, look, my car wasn't perfect to begin with. I'm not going to worry about really small things. But literally, car access is hugely expensive, and, and parking is, does all sorts of distortionary things, so land use and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, we really should be able to figure out, and I, I would double and triple down on figuring out how to get sharing of cars and sharing of rides. And there's a lot of social components to that. Um, w without getting into too much detail, when we were looking at all, all the major casual carpooling systems had a disruptor. Uh, there was a, a toll that was introduced in the across in, in the Bay Area, um, and and that impacted things. There, there was um, something in the DC area. And and the big thing that the disruptors weren't huge, but they required Casual carpooling went down very significantly until the social arrangements sort of re, re, reconfigured themselves. So I really think we should double and triple down on figuring out how to make some of this stuff work in the current and modern context. I mean, people have done these dystopian things with automated vehicles where if everyone can just hop in their own automated vehicle, you actually can probably have a whole lot more miles because they're going to be driving around much like you can learn a lot from looking at ride hail data, by the way, because it's it's indicative of the demand and the desire of people. There's there's a driver; it's not automated, but those requests are coming in as if if they're automated vehicles. And there's you know, it's not like a it's it's not solving all of our problems. So I don't know. I think we should sort of focus on things that are today ish, um, which are getting more use of vehicles um, and more pooling within vehicles. Thank you. 
So talk about real, I think we got about two minutes here. Is there a pipeline for bringing people into the t uh, TISMO and the TDM, let's just say area? Uh, and if there isn't, should there be one? And what does that look like? Yeah, I guess I'm answering this one. <laughs> um, yes, 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 yes. I think um, the next generation and how to encourage them is really important. We're doing some things not um, cutting edge. I really, I, I also lead some of the workforce development, and um, we're really copying other states. I would say um, Oregon's doing a fantastic job with educating youth around our profession. They have high school summer camps and high school internships, and and so we're really trying to borrow from them. We just um, launched two um, high school summer camps last year. It was a, a week um, on campus um, program where we had 25 students um, attend either University of Washington or Washington State University so that they could learn about the profession and uh, super successful. Um, we were funding it again this year and also thinking of other creative ways to bring youth into the um, in, into the, the field. I'll say one place where I think is would be super awesome is um, I was at a, an emergency response peer exchange and FHWA was there talking about their emergency response team. And I mean, I just think it's like the FBI's for transportation professionals and what kid would not love that? So I think there's so many things that we can all do to educate this next generation of the cool things that we do. I think they think we just build roads and we do so much more. <laughs> yeah, for, for elementary school and then for high schoolers, let them go out and see what we do. I mean, we do such cool things from avalanche mitigation to, um, I mean, we do, I, I mean, I'm, I, the list goes on. I think we do some really cool things. I think kids are really interested in hacking now. We, ha we have so many hackers out there, so maybe have a hack -a hackathon for them. I think... Um, it's our time to, to share what we do. We're kind of like, um, what was it? Um, I, I don't know. You see so many like Denzel Washington and all these actors doing, you know, these, you know, their pilots and, you know, doing things. And I think now we need to get cool actors to do transportation movies for us. So. All right. So I guess we should, I'm not going to ask this last question since we only have a few minutes. See if yeah, there's any questions. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, Frank Joey Lacey up in New York, great panel. I'm a big fan of, of uh, my colleague, Carrie Snyder, but I'm not an audience plant here. There's a lot of interest in this intersection. So with that said, any examples of where you've seen improvements in mobility or optimization because TDM was integrated into TDM strategies and how? And then I have a follow-on question there. Does a playbook exist on optimizing TISMO by integrating TDM? If not, I and some others are very interested. Uh, well, um, I think we've identified, we've done a good job of identifying opportunities. Part of identifying opportunities is we do have data that comes from some supportive strategies. So, for instance, we've done a number of really a kind of small pilots that are instructive. We did a really cool pilot in Minnesota where we took people who were already buying their monthly parking passes and we, we tested different products. And we had a, I think the product that was most successful we, was named the Pago Flex Pass. So essentially, we guaranteed the operators at least half the revenue that they got before. We capped the price the user would have to pay at the full price they were paying before. Um, we took the average number of days people were parking and then we had a rebate scheme where the the pass, we gave them a transit pass, and we, they paid only a small amount for the transit, and then they were saving money entirely if they weren't using it at all, the, the days. And we were able to bring, oh, I'm trying to remember the number, but it's very significant. We brought the number of use days, and again, these are people that are buying monthly transit passes. We brought the number of use days down quite a lot. We've seen other stuff in the parking space, too. Even even in I, I'm U, UCAL, uh, Berkeley, there wasn't really a political consensus to change the parking rates, like so that it's quite quite low. But what they did was instead of just paying a monthly fee up front, you pay daily until you hit the monthly cap. So instead of eighty dollars a month, you were paying ten dollars a day until you hit it. That delayed a lot of people <laughs> parking and and actually brought, even though they 
largely paying the same amount. They was like, geez, I could avoid paying that 10 bucks today. Let me just sort of get there a different way. So there, there are a lot of sort of little lessons through smaller studies that have, we've used to inform our modeling for some of these kind of more innovative policy things that we've looked at, so. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie from the District Department of Transportation. Um, my question is, do you ever see TDM strategies or approaches in TISMO to be at odds? I'm still learning about TISMO, but I feel like I see a lot of language about like, vehicle flow and keeping traffic moving, and I don't always personally see congestion as a bad thing at all, so just curious <laughs> of your thoughts on that. Um, I would say yes. So it, there are many ways in which uh, TISMO and TDM strategies can be deployed together to improve operations. I think it comes down to understanding the user that you're trying to prioritize on a given roadway or on a given corridor. Because you, if you're trying to prioritize uh, bicycle and pedestrian use, you're not prioritizing freight. You know, I, I think that bike ped and transit prioritization can go together. Um, but you also see that in, in curb space management. You know, when you're talking about loading zone and a transit stop, and, you know, commercial loading zone, a transit stop, um, first, last mile, you know, where you're, where you're parking your shared mobility. So I, I think it's really important to look at the bigger picture, to look at your entire system and identify where you're prioritizing which user uh, to avoid those conflicts. Okay. So we're at... We're at the end of our session. I'd like to um, thank Bob, Alan, Carrie, and Pam uh, for their great information that they shared with us. Um, so let's just give them a round of applause. And um, I would also encourage everyone, if you have more questions, stop by the NOCO booth. Um, and then our panelists will be up here for a little while. If you have questions, feel free to just come up and um, ask those questions. So thank you, everybody.